Dear students, hello and welcome to our interview for Lecture 9 of our series World in Transition. We have with us Dr. Paulini and Dr. Beck to discuss their very interesting presentations that they've just given and answer some questions. Thank you very much for being here today. Okay, so to start off with, um, in your presentation we had this very interesting discussion between science and politics and how they must work together. Um, of course, do you think there are disadvantages that come with this? For example, there's this discussion of whether we think science is supposed to be free to you know, go their own route um, and they shouldn't be guided by politics, for example. And do you see this as a good point? In my view, um, I think there are two things that the autonomy of science and the integrity of science is a very important issue. If science is getting politicized and uh, instrumentalized only to support decision making or to support a particular opinion, science has really a problem. At the same time, if you take scientific outcomes and you talk to politicians or everyday persons, they will not understand what, for instance, physicists say about the two degree target. So I think there's also a need to translate or to make scientific findings more understandable, more relevant to the opinion or to the way how different persons in their way, in their life, um, operate, that they can understand what scientists want to tell them and to, to work with the insight of science. So in order, I would argue that um, you have scientists producing scientific reports and then you have experts or expertise as a filter or as a translating institution or mechanism in order to um, to translate what the scientist wants to say and to make it more understandable for people who have to work or take decision on this kind of advice. Yes, and of course I suppose we have to sort of guide the science as well so that they're researching the right thing that's relevant for the transition. Yeah, but we have also to think about mechanisms to protect science from direct influences from whatever lobby groups and things like that. So I think it's a very important value to have this kind of autonomy of science. Okay, yes. And would you agree? Yes, of course. In Germany it's a constitutional right for science to be free mm -hmm. and not for anybody to tell them what to do research on. So that's a very basic right. Mm. Yeah. which still, coming to the report written by the WBGU on the transformation, um, in this report uh, the Council says that science, as well as everybody else in society, needs to participate in the transformation process. So science within itself should look for, for processes to find you know, the new issues and what is there lacking in the current research topics that should be worked on to um, support the transformation. Okay, so Dr. Beck, um, I found it interesting how in your presentation you talked about advocacy um, and said that you know science, scientists shouldn't be advocates, um, whereas with the WBGU they do kind of recommend a certain route to take, um, which is advocacy in a way, so I was wondering if there was a difference between these two types if you want to start answering that. I guess that there are different forms of advocacy. Um, as um, Councillor Merkel in her talks um, reminds us, the role of scientists is to warn, and as she expresses, I don't know the, what the term is, but please bother me if there is a problem. You have to say, listen, there is a problem and we should react to this problem. At the same time, I think experts are not stealth decision makers. Their job is not to decide what Germany or other countries or other people institutions should do. They should not say, hey, you have to act in this way and you should go there and things like that. So the job of experts is not to compel um, policy makers to do one particular thing, but it's more to open up, to show, to explore 
listen, you have the problem, but you have a variety, a broad range of options how to direct to these problems. And their, their task is also to explore if you take this option, then these are the impacts, these are the costs and the things like that. It's not to close down the debate on options how to react, but more to open up and show possibility choices and things like that. Yes, and the I guess the WDBGU flagship report does provide many options. So, but yeah. Yeah, that's right. The flagship report starts with, the, if you wish to call it that, the situation of the world and saying where the, the ecosystems are or our, where our use of natural resources and energy and so on takes us and what options we have and what different pathways that can be described for different countries to go or different options within one country that policy or society can choose from. Mm -hmm. And also the advice therein is not just to describe you know, a pathway or an option, but maybe to say if you do not act, what happens then? So if the trends just go on the way they are on right now, no political societal action taken, where do we end up? And then that can be a basis for a societal discussion, a debate, a public debate. How do we want to live? Do we want to get there? Do we want to change things beforehand? Sure. So basically helping the decisions, decision makers make an informed decision by providing all the information. Okay, great. And I was wondering with um, the previous reports that you've done, um, Obviously, when the reports are published, the issue doesn't just end there. So I was wondering kind of what happens after they're, after they're publicized. Um, part of my talk was on the activities that WBGU members and the scientific staff do. And that is part of what we do. We just talk about things after they are published, but in very different intensities. And the public debate has never been as intense as um, now, as it's going on now with the transformation report. Mm -hmm. So um, yes, there is some sort of follow-up, um, and now up to now there has not been a very detailed, um, you know, follow-up work on all the issues that the council has worked on, which is not even possible because it has dealt with so many different topics. But as you also may have heard in the talk, that some issues come again, mm -hmm. and then they are worked on from a different perspective, like the oceans. Mm -hmm. So there was a publication on oceans in the year 2006, and there will be another one distinctly different on oceans in the year 2012. So it's not a direct follow-up, but it's a, a re-analysis um, of what is urgent now, so the council decided now that the oceans are a very, very, very urgent issue. Mm. So now you will have a flagship report on that uh, topic soon. Okay, so they basically evolve with the different topics that emerge and that become important. Yes. Um, so there are three different sectors that kind of affect the transformation, and we could say that they were the scientists, the politicians, and the public. Um, I was interested if maybe you could go into what their roles are and if one sector has a more important role than the other. Maybe you could start on this question. I think um, you missed one very important sector and that's the business world um. stakeholder. And I think in order to implement or to move on with this transformation, it's also very important to get the business world on board. That's one point. And the second point is that um, I, uh, my experience is that there should be a clear um, division of labor. It should be very clear what the responsibilities of different um, groups or different um, sectors are. That, uh, For instance, um, that's clear that um, advisory bodies do not do politics or they do not do research. So if not, you have a lot of boundary work fights about who's responsible and who not. But it's pretty open and it's pretty dependent on the cases. In some cases, you need more policy advice or more advice on political question. And you get more involved into politics. In a lot of cases, it's a very technical issue. And then there, I think there are, there are no fights between experts and politicians who is responsible or what roles they should play. 
Mm. Yeah, so it's about responsibility. Okay, do you have something to add? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, in the report, one very, very main recommendation of the WBGU was that the state has to be the first one to set the frameworks right meaning to set the frameworks in a way, to set politics in a way, or to, to, um, to um, design governance systems in a way that the other stakeholders and other actors in this concert can act sustainably. And um, that has a lot to do with the price for CO2 emissions, with the markets, with the frameworks for markets, with subsidies, with many, many things. So we do not say that the others are not or less important, but the, the WBGU does say that the state should be the first one to really act to set the frameworks right so that you, know, you can get this tipping of the entire process within the society and the businesses and markets. Okay, so Dr. Paolini, going back to how these um, reports are received, um, how does the debate kind of evolve from there on? I mean, we know that it's not in a linear way. Um, could you maybe go into how the debates then evolve? I don't think there is a general answer. It depends on the topic, on the issue, and on the time that we are in. Um, as an example, when we published the report, the, the transformation report, Fukushima had just happened. So the entire world listened and saw this report and received the report uh, w with a different understanding. Mm. So you never know before publishing a report what time you get into. So there is no general answer how that evolves. And it depends on how the general situation is and how general debates are. Um, another example, when we pub published the report on bioenergy and sustainable land use, um, at least in Germany, a lot of the discussion had been going on beforehand. So, you know, the, the, the ground that received this report was a very different one and many um, laws had been made already. So politics was not open at all at that time point to take up our recommendations, which after they learned that what they had done was not perfect, they came back to our report a bit later and looked at the recommendations again. So it always depends. Yes, of course in something like this where it's quite urgent that we act now, um, it's quite important also that I guess that it's well received as soon as possible. Um, and then to move on, um, Dr. Beck, you mentioned in your presentation that people trust in they don't trust in science, but they trust in the authority of science. And could you go into that a bit further, what that means? In a lot of cases, and in, uh, when it comes to risk and risk management, we can see that the quality of science, the content of science was not the problem. The quality was quite high, especially in the case of the IPCC, for instance, the latest reports there have been very consensual. It was high qualitative scientific input. And all the commissions that have reviewed the IPCC came to the conclusion that the content is fine, it's perfect. But at the same time, you can also see um, that trust is dependent on the ways how institutions, how personalities, how leaders like the IPCC chairman react to problems. And if, if mass media or if some scientist, some blogger get the feeling that he is not open, he is not hard, honest and he's and then they make the argument that he's corrupt and things like that and y you can see that the p performance of institutions the way they interact with the public this creates problems of mistrust in other words it's also very important um, how institutions react to problems if they seem as transparent as open as accountable and things like that and if they don't do it then they have a problem with public trust. Okay, so the main thing for trust we would say was for those involved to act professionally. Yeah, or more transparent, more open, showing that they do not have to hide something. 
to gain the public's trust, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes sense. Um, Open the doors and show how you work, for instance, mm. and this helps to create more trust into science. Yes, very important. Mm. And going back to the flagship report, what happens if, you know, we're talking about how it's important that um, politicians react well to it, at least at some point, but what happens if they disagree with the report when it comes out? Then that is so. Mm -hmm. So, um, as we have learned from Silke Beck in her talk, in episode one of this lecture, is that there is not just one model and there is not just the linear model. So if you have a set of recommendations given by a scientific advisory body, whatever body that is, um, that does not necessarily mean that politicians go there, take the recommendations and just put them into action. Um, but the framework is much more delicate and you have politicians, you have businesses, you have science, uh, other areas of the scientific community, you have the man and woman on the street, you have students, students, <laughs> and all of these groups, of course, can get involved in debates, on all the debates with a societal relevance. So if they take up recommendations or part or thoughts, of this flagship report and think that it's very important, they will create a sort of, you know, political pressure. And that, of course, makes politicians to act differently compared to the situation if this pressure wasn't there. And that is what we see and what we say in the flagship report, that society acts like that. So if you have pioneers of change or change agents that start debating things or doing things differently, that creates a certain power or pressure within society. Mm -hmm. Which will then have an effect maybe on the science that gets carried out. So you think this is that holds true for everything. Yeah, it's all for connected. political action, for the energy system, for the financial systems, for the education and research system, and we believe holds true for the topics that the scientific community works on mm -hmm. also. Yes. So even science gets affected by public pressure, I suppose. It's not as simple as, for example, the politicians um, decide what needs to be researched and the politicians tell the scientists and what to do, for example. It's a slightly broader than that. But I think there are different forms of, of um, politicization or of political influence on science. One is, as we have seen in the case of climate change, that there are lobby groups that really take scientific results and try to deconstruct or to delegitimize scientific advice and try to delay political action. That's a very unconstructive way. On the other side, there is also there are the publics, there are bloggers, things like that. that call for more accountability, for more openness in science. And they also want to have a say when it comes to what is relevant knowledge or what's of, of what is our tax money paid for when it comes to research. They want to have a greater influence on defining what relevant science is and things like that. Or they want to participate in producing knowledge. You have a lot of lay groups when it comes to health issues and things like that. And I think we have to distinguish between different forms. You have a direct influence from lobby groups trying to influence science in a particular direction, but you have also public groups and they want to cooperate with science, but in a more um, democratic way. Yeah, so science is influenced in many ways then. Yeah. Mm. And now Dr. Pellini, I just had a couple of questions to end with about the VBG reports. Um, for example, um, where are they sent to and who reads them when they're published? We don't know exactly who reads them, but when we publish a new report, we uh, put quite a bit of effort into making address lists and to see whom we think the report would be relevant for. 
And these lists um, comprise, of course, a number of names in Germany, in Europe, in the European political field and the European Commission and Parliament and so. We also usually um, look at organizations, international institutions of trade, of the United Nations, of the world and other banks, the World Bank in itself, but you also have continental banks when it relates to financial issues. So there are many different um, arenas uh, where we try to think of and what we see is that many of the reports sort of diffuse um, and uh, quite a number of people at universities in India and other countries have ordered quite a pack of reports which shows us that students or, or, or um, teachers, lecturers at universities in the university field are interested in our topics and that makes us very happy. Yeah. So we cannot count it one by one but it seems to be quite a spread. Yeah, but it's very encouraging. And um, what about if I wanted to get hold of the flagship report for example, where can I find it? All the reports and everything we produced it can be ordered on the website. There is a button on the website, order mm -hmm. button. Um, and so um, some things are just not reprinted re again. Then you have to deal with a PDF version. But normally you can order it on the website. OK, so online is the best bet. Great. Everything, yes. Um, what kind of involvement does the WBG have in international conferences, for example, or any kind of conference like the Rio Plus 20, for example? We have been observers to all the conferences since 1992 when it comes to the issues of climate change, the UNFCCC conferences. Uh, we were at the conferences that dealt with uh, land degradation and desertification and also at the conferences dealing with biodiversity and to the big Rio conference. So we try to keep track of the political processes and of the changes because that is basically our job, to observe the entire governance situation on all the issues of sustainable development worldwide. Absolutely. So of course that is part of our work. Yes, and for giving input as well, I would assume. Yes, giving input in, part of in, 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 in the form of statements or policy papers and uh, it's not so often that we give direct inputs in the negotiations. Yeah, um, but as you were talking about in your presentation, um, the Council has had a lot of impact. For example, this 2% guardrail, even though sometimes I guess it can take a bit of time to push through. For example, in five years, I think it was in this case. What happened in the meantime of when you decided on this guardrail and when it became policy? I'm not into the discussions in detail that took place back then, but basically it's, I can just say what I just said, which is true for all the debates following the reports or following recommendations, that some sort of debate takes place. Um, and I don't know who was first to take, uh, to take it up, to take up the WBGU and others' recommendations to say we need a guardrail that is very just one number, easy to understand, easy to negotiate with. You know, there were many, um, many um, parts of this two degree guardrail construction basically that could be taken up pretty well by negotiators. So, but also that always takes quite a bit of time because you have so many countries involved, 192 countries, and all these parties sort of have to follow through and finally agree to yeah. such a goal or guardrail. So it's a, it's a long process involving a lot of debate, you'd say. Um, and finally, you were talking about how students should get involved um, in this discussion and so on. Would you have um, any advice for them of how they should get involved? In the process of the transformation? Yes, yes, or the WBGU or anything. Um, well, looking at the entire number of the students worldwide, the WBGU is just a very little yes. unit. Um, so the direct involvement is somewhat limited, but of course everybody can 
try to discuss wherever they are in their lecture with their co-students, with their mom and dad and brother and whoever on the street, you know, how do we want to live and what could our participate, what, what could our contribution be? Or if you go into research, as a young researcher, you could think, you know, what can I, as an economist, as in whatever your area of research is, could I contribute? What questions could I try to answer to further the process of the transformation or to further the debate itself? You know, how do people debate? How do people discuss? Do they understand each other? Why not, maybe? Um, how do people organize processes? How do they decide on things? Do they just do it um, driven by, by um, scientific facts? What other issues are involved in decisions? You know, you can, can you make them transparent? So hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of questions out there mm -hmm. to be thought about and to be worked about on the processes themselves. Yes, also. so you just want a lot, as many people thinking about the topic as possible. Yeah. And you would agree with the advice? Yeah, and um, as our, at our institute, for instance, PhD students started with concrete um, um, options where we could participate, for instance, when it comes to waste management, when it comes to if we fly to conferences to reduce our own carbon print. And I think it's very important, and it could be one contribution of students to the whole transformation process, is to collect this kind of good practices, to collect uh, cases that can motivate other persons to be behave or to, to move on in this way. Mm -hmm. Okay, well that's great advice from both of you, and um, you've given us a lot to think about in your presentations and a lot to think about in your answers to the questions, so um, thank you very much for being here, um, and I hope that our students have also found it very enlightening. Thank you. <laughs>